be blessings. And we lift our prayers up to you, our Father in heaven, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, I'm going to uh, read uh, a passage, uh, our scripture reading today from Deuteronomy. You can find on page 150. Uh, I'm going to read from uh, chapter 5, verses 6 through 21, and I'll reread again verses 12 through 15 uh, specifically. Uh, after that, you know, you'll see in your order of worship, there's a, a spot that says, uh, they're responding to God's word, where it says leader. I'll read the leader part, and we're responding to the part in full uh, after that. So again, turning to uh, Deuteronomy chapter 5, starting at verse 6. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is on the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. The Lord your God will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy. As the Lord your God commanded you, six days you shall labor and do all your work. The seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work. You or your son or your daughter, or your male servant or your female servant, or your ox or your donkey or any of your livestock, or the sojourner within your gates, that your, male, that your male servant and your female servant may rest as well as you. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. Honor your father and your mother, as the Lord your God commanded you, that your days may be long, and that it may go well with you in the land that the Lord your God has given you. You shall not murder, and you shall not commit adultery, and you shall not steal, and you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, and you shall not desire your neighbor's house, his field, his male servant, his female servant, his ox or his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. Again, verses 12 through 15, Observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy, as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work. You or your son or your daughter or your male servant or your female servant or your ox, your donkey, or any of your livestock, the sojourner who is within your gates, that your male servant, your female servant may rest as well as you. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandments of the Lord, the commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Praise God for whom all blessings flow. Amen. Amen. I encourage you to keep your Bible open. Uh, the passage that's. Uh, Joey just read. Uh, we are working through the Ten Commandments. We're in a larger study in the book of Deuteronomy. Uh, as you can tell that we're in the Ten Commandments and sort of slowed down a pretty fast pace of Deuteronomy in order for ten weeks to take um, to take a closer look at the, the Ten Commandments, the formal law of God. Uh, throughout the sermon, I'm going to reference other Bible passages. Uh, the big numbers in the Bible we call chapters, and the little numbers we call verses. And I will. Uh, give you uh, other chapters and verses and page numbers uh, in that Black Church Bible uh, so you can find them or write them down uh, so you can find them later. By the way, if you don't have a copy of the Bible, please take a copy of that Black Bible with you. That's uh, our gift to you. We don't want you to leave here without God's Word. And we don't want you to leave here without a personal relationship with Jesus, which you will hear more about throughout the service uh, as well. So how are you today? Good. All right. All right. right. So far, okay. It's amazing how often uh, I ask that question to people. The answer is, I'm tired. I'm tired. You ever given that answer? You ever felt that? Uh, is that you today? Are you tired? 
you know, we're all on some level tired. Maybe it's physical, maybe it's emotional, maybe you have some relational fatigue, or maybe you just feel really, really spiritually tired, maybe spiritually dry, kind of washed up right now. And God has something to say to our fatigue. That's what we come to here in the fourth commandment. He has something to say to tired people. And in studying the Ten Commandments, we've learned some things so far. The first three commandments, we've learned who to worship, the first command, and that is Jesus Christ. We've learned in the second commandment how to worship, or to worship in awe of a God that we can't contain. And that's why it's so silly to make some kind of carved image and say, that's my God, or this, this thing helps me work, worship a God who's beyond our understanding at all times. And last week, in the third commandment, we learned to care for God's name, to care for all the things of this God whom we are to worship with wonder and with awe. And today, in the fourth commandment, we're learning to honor God's rest. It's uh, kind of a, a difficult sermon to preach. It's really a really hard one to, to work through in preparation because the application of the fourth commandment is a very, very controversial and divisive thing. thing. How do we apply Sabbath rest? And I'm sure my inbox is going to be flooded this week with emails or you're going to corner me after the service because there's so much to talk about concerning the Sabbath. Even something like which day do we worship? What kind of work is allowed and what isn't allowed on the Sabbath day? Can I go out to eat and make other people work? Am I in sin if I work on Sunday or if I'm called into work? on Sunday. So much to say, and I, and I really want to uh, say this uh, so where you can hear it. I am available to talk with you about uh, the Sabbath following uh, today or later on today. But I want to give us five preliminary things briefly before we actually dig into the text that I, I hope will help us think about uh, Sabbath rest, which the word Sabbath means rest or it means ceasing. First, interestingly, it's one of two of the Ten Commandments that stated kind of positively. All the other ones are like, do not, don't do this, and you shall not. But actually the Sabbath says to observe, the Sabbath commandment, the fourth commandment says, look or observe. Now it does tell us not to do certain things, but the framework is actually put positively. Observe the Sabbath as holy, which is kind of ironic because we often can think about the Sabbath commandment and what can't I do? The Sabbath is a call actually to do something. Secondly, we need to think about what might lie behind the questions of what can I or can't I do as it pertains to Sabbath rest. Because I think if, if we really took a close look at our hearts like God does, um, sometimes what might be hidden in there is what can I get away with before God on the Sabbath. Third, the Sabbath isn't primarily about us. Very, very important that we get this. Because you see here in the text, the Sabbath is to be unto the Lord. It's not rest for rest's sake. It's rest for Jesus' sake. It's not a call to be slothful, but to be at the holy, doing the holy work of resting. Fourth, Sabbath rest is a gift. It's not meant to be a chore. It's actually a gift from a loving God. The problem is, like money and tithing, uh, rest is something we all want, well, Sabbath is something we want more of. And God says, give it to me, and give it to me one day a week. It's give it to me because it's good for me. Good for you. Fifth, and lastly, this is an important point that I hope you'll see is woven throughout the sermon. The Bible is actually pretty quiet about the application of Sabbath. Here's exactly what to do with Sabbath rest. Man, historically, has been very loud about this. But the Bible itself is relatively quiet about what it means to have Sabbath rest. And so we need to be careful as we're saying this is what it means. Here's what I think it means. Or, this is what this person thinks it means. We need to be careful to hold that somewhat loosely. All right, let's look at the text here. Uh, I'm going to do something a little abnormal. I'm actually going to jump to verse 13 first, uh, because the fourth commandment, the seventh commandment, 
includes something that's often overlooked. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. Amen. And God's original design of things, six days, not five days, let alone four or three, which some advocate for, six days are given for humans to do their work. Now, most of us feel entitled to a five-day, at most, work week. Or, or to put it this way, we feel entitled to two days off or two days of rest. But the five-day we work week, or the, the two-day weekend in the United States, isn't even something that's a hundred years old. It began to give a Jewish workers a day off because their day of rest, their day of worship, was Saturday. So it began by giving an opportunity for Jewish laborers to actually have a day off. Sunday was already a day off for Christians, and kind of over time, it sort of morphed into this, this two-day rest weekend. No, I'm starting to, some of you may get a little jumpy. I've been a little jumpy myself thinking about this uh, this week. They became two normal, workless days. So the fourth commandment, I think, is as much about having a healthy and hard work ethic as it is rest from work. Both work and rest are given for the glory of God. Now, we don't want to be legalistic here. We can do that. That's where our hearts jump to very quickly. But we do want to be careful of why and what we might feel entitled to. I think that if we, we sort of had a, a higher view of six days being the, the sort of normal work and normal life cycle from God, a sort of more intense work ethic, it would actually help us more easily observe the kind of Sabbath rest that God wants from his people. You know, many, maybe most of us, or all of us, seek more rest, not more work. We all kind of know we need rest, right? Amen. And this isn't in and of itself bad. The fourth commandment is not a call to fill up each hour and every moment of six days to work. That's not what the fourth commandment is a call to do. Fill it up so that you've done your duty. But that's probably not the biggest issue for most of us, is it? A strong zeal to continue to fill up our work week. Probably, if you're honest, and more like me, then you might want to admit that you are, sloth is probably the bigger issue in your heart. A sloth is not preached about a whole lot. Um, but the Bible does talk about it. I, I want us to look at a few places in Proverbs uh, that talks about this. You turn to page 536, that's Proverbs 13. 543, Proverbs 21. Proverbs 6, page 531. I want to read a few uh, verses, a passage to you about sloth. Look at Proverbs 13, verse 4, page 536. The soul of the sluggard craves and gets nothing, while the soul of the diligent is richly su supplied. Amen. The sluggard, his soul craves for things, but he doesn't do anything about it, and so he ends up getting nothing. Look at chapter 21, verse 25 of Proverbs. The desire of the sluggard kills him. So it slowly eats at him. He desires things. For his hands refuse to labor. The desire of the sluggard kills him. He's got desire. He wants certain fruit from labor. But his hands refuse to labor kind of sits around and does nothing. And then chapter 6 of Proverbs, this is a, a famous uh, passage. It's actually put to a song by someone named Judy Rogers. It's a, it's a really great song. Some of you know this. This isn't just for kids either. It's a wonderful, wonderful song for adults to get scripture in you. Proverbs chapter 6, verses 6 through 11. Listen to this. Go to the ant, O oh sluggard, that little itty-bitty ant that you'd rather just crush. Listen, you can learn something from the ant. 
Consider her ways and be wise. Without having any chief or officer or ruler, no boss and no accountability. She prepares her bread in summer and gathers her food in harvest. How long will you lie there, O sluggard? When will you arise from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. Poverty will come upon you like a robber and want like an armed man. All of us, because we are sinful, broken, self-centered people, I'm talking to myself as I talk to you, struggle with differing levels, with sloth. But let me tell you something. Jesus has grace for those who are slothful. He has forgiveness for your moments of slothfulness. Jesus has grace and forgiveness for, quote, bad work ethics. And Jesus has it through the best work ethic ever, the self-denying, fully obedient sacrifice that was deadly for slothful sinners like you and for me. Jesus left heaven as God, clothed himself in humanity, and perfectly did the work of obedience, even obedience to the point of death on a cross when the judgment of the living God fell upon him for all of our sins, including all of our sloth, for those that will trust that his death and shed blood is for you to forgive you of your sins. Amen. Now, some of us might not struggle with sloth. We think, hey, a six-day work week, that's awesome. I get to do more work. Some of us, maybe. But I want to challenge us, as I've even thought about that uh, myself, not that I have the greatest work ethic, but I'm thinking about my own labors this week and the constant nature of them. And I thought, you know what? I need to repent of my pride. I need to repent of thinking I have a good work ethic and I have... I work hard. People need to appreciate me because I work hard. Look at what I produce. That's private work. And that needs to be repented of, those of us that might not struggle with sloth. Because we can actually find our identity, foolish as it is, in a good work ethic. Working hard and working tirelessly. Finding our identity and seeking and accomplishing projects and work. All that needs forgiveness too, just like the sin of slothfulness. Now, a good, a biblical work ethic, which is a call for thinking of probably more days of labor than most of us are thinking about, as we see it here in the fourth command. A good biblical work ethic, work ethic also includes proper rest, and that's what we come to in verses 12 through 14. Hey, I I, uh, I was cheap on you guys today. I didn't give you my outline, did I? Bad pastor I am. <laughs> so verse 13, Sabbath and work. That's what we were just looking at. And now verses 12 and 14, Sabbath and rest. And then we'll see and celebrate in verse 15, Sabbath and salvation. <coughs> Sabbath and work, Sabbath and rest, and Sabbath and salvation. Look at verses 12 and 14. I'll read verse 13 with it as well. Observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter or your male servant or your female servant or your ox or your donkey or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. That your male servant and your female servant may rest as well as you. Now, the Lord made the Sabbath, and he made the Sabbath holy. That is a churchy word for something being special or set apart. And that's why Israel and why us, why we need to, to keep the Sabbath day holy or keep Sabbath rest holy or different. Now, for Jews, as many of you will know, that started sundown on Friday night and went through sunset on uh, Saturday. But since the death and resurrection of Jesus, most Christians rest and gather on Sunday. The first day of the week, Acts chapter 20, verses 7 and following, page 292 of your Black Bible. Most Christians have gathered on that first day of the week on the day Jesus was raised from the dead. 
John chapter 20, page 906 of your Black Bible. Most Christians have gathered on what we would call Victory Day, the day that Jesus had his full triumph over our sin in his glorious resurrection. And some people call Sunday the Christian Sabbath, or they'll call it the Lord's Day, as we see in Revelation chapter 1, verse 10, page 1028. Some, though, who profess faith in Jesus, the Seventh-day Adventist, the property you might be using, on a Sunday, most notably, say that Christians need to worship on Saturday because that's God's Sabbath. Now, there are a lot of reasons why I, I think that's wrong, uh, particularly is how we think about how Jesus transforms and fulfills the Fourth Commandment. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment when we get to verse 15 and we talk about Sabbath and <coughs> salvation. Yet we need to be, be careful to, to not lose focus on the main issue, keeping Sabbath rest holy. Of course, the, the million dollar question, right, is well, what does that look like? What does it look like to keep Sabbath rest holy? And we're given some help here, right, in the text, right? We're to refrain from our regular work. That's what's getting being gotten at here in Deuteronomy chapter 5. And in Moses' day, that was almost exclusively agricultural, like farming. And that's why you see the, the mention of the, the animals here. And so outside of what we might call works of necessity, something that, that had to be done which couldn't be prepared for, ceasing from regular work was to be done in order to have a holy rest unto the Lord. And that included children, employees and working animals and the, the sojourner, which means the, the resident alien, someone outside of Israel that had been accepted into Israel, had subjected themselves and been subjected to their laws. And so as we think about this, because this is this is um, this is for the covenant community. Okay, this is for the believing community of God. And so as we think about this for us, I'm not sure that going out to eat with the waitress serving you is, is breaking the Sabbath as we might understand it. And I know many would disagree with that, and I used to actually disagree with that. But that's, that's not forcing the covenant community to work at the expense of rest. And that's what's going on here in the fourth commandment, forcing people in the covenant community to, to work at the expense of them getting rest. I've actually heard, including from some pastors, I've heard them say the very opposite of going out to eat and having a, a waitress or waiter serve you is breaking the Sabbath. Because it allows their, their wives or whoever cooks and cleans to actually rest from that normal labor. And I don't know. You know, there's a whole lot of I don't knows as it, as it pertains to the fourth commandment. But I do know that we should take care not to be quick to condemn a view we've never thought about or initially disagree with. And here's why. The Sabbath isn't the gospel. The Sabbath is not the gospel. It is not the same thing as Jesus leaving heaven, living perfectly on earth, dying as a substitution for you and for me and for all who will believe in order to secure their salvation. Keeping Sabbath is not the same thing as trusting in Jesus for salvation. We have to make sure that we don't elevate something above the gospel, which is our tendency. Now, even though it's not the gospel, it is still a gift to the people of the gospel. It is still a gift to the people of God to be received by faith. And you know, Israel was really no different from us. We've seen this a bunch of times well, every week as we've been studying Deuteronomy. They might wonder, well, how do I get this done and that done if I really rest from my normal labors? But remember, God is a God who provides. He doesn't give commands without also providing in light of his people obeying his commands. If you were to flip over to Exodus chapter 16, you don't need to do that, but Exodus chapter 16, which is page 58 of your Black Bible, we'll look at that later on, it's a wonderful chapter of God's promise to care for his people. There he says, I will give you a double portion of food on the sixth day as a provision for the seventh. I'll take care of you 
if you do what I say. Of course, that general principle holds true for all God's commands and all the things that he asks us to trust me and obey me and doing what I say. I will care for you. I know what I'm talking about. God alone has the right to say that to his people. You see, the principle is true, right? If we trust God, work diligently. We'll find God faithful for all the provisions we need for the kind of rest he calls his people into. I've had uh, a number of people over the years tell me that when they made deliberate decisions to, to not work or students say not to study on, on Sundays, they, they've actually found themselves getting more done. And uh, don't hear me saying that if you get called into work, you have to work, or if you end up studying on Sundays, you're necessarily in sin. That's not what I'm saying. But we do need to think about why we make the choices we do, whether or not fear might be attached to some of those choices. Are we afraid, struggling to trust God, that things won't work out because we may be rested on Sunday, did some things different deliberately? But be careful. Be careful not to do what my heart is so prone to do. Gather together, make a bunch of do's and don'ts to get right so I can please God. God is pleased in Jesus. Amen. You understand that? God is pleased alone at the end of the day by sending Jesus into this world to live and die for you and be raised from the grave. That's where his satisfaction is found. We, we can't satisfy God with any ounce of our obedience is always tainted with our sin. And so if do's and don'ts become the focus of Sabbath discussion, we'll end up like a group of people in Jesus' day. Any of the kids know the group of people I'm getting ready to mention? You can't say that, man. We talked about that. Okay. The Pharisees. You guys ever heard of the Pharisees before? Yeah, those are, I'm talking to everybody. Those are, those are people who made do's and don'ts, especially as it pertains to the Sabbath, one of their most central focuses. Ironically, Pharisee means set apart. It actually means sort of holy, special. For them, it was holy and special in the sense of self-righteous. You see, they, they thought they had living for God down especially as it pertained to this Sabbath command. They created rule after rule after rule after rule for how to keep Sabbath. And they practically elevated those rules over time to be on par with Scripture. The Word of God and the Word of man equal. I've heard it said that they, I think I may have even said this here before, that they didn't want people to ever see a reflection of themselves on the Sabbath because if they saw a gray hair, they might be tempted to pull it out. <laughs> That'd be worse. It would be breaking Sabbath. We laugh about it, but it's kind of sad that there are people trapped under such beliefs, right? Or maybe a more modern day. This is a, a real example. A rabbi was preaching about the, the Sabbath, and uh, afterwards, one of the the people said, hey, is it, is it wrong for me? Am I breaking the Sabbath by load the dishwasher? Load the dishwasher on the Sabbath day. And here's what the rabbi said. No, not if you just sort of randomly put the dishes in there. But if you take the time to systematically load the dishwasher, you've broken the Sabbath. You've not kept the Sabbath holy unto the Lord. If you systematically load your dishwasher, person took that as the very word of God, the application of Sabbath command straight from God. Now Jesus had many encounters with these Pharisees. Matthew chapter 12 is a famous passage uh, about the Sabbath. And one of the most revealing encounters, I think, though, is actually in John chapter 9, that's 895 and 896, one of the most revealing encounters that Jesus had with these Pharisees um, had to do with Jesus healed a man who was blind from birth. This guy I've never seen before. And Jesus healed this man. It's actually one of my favorite stories in the whole Bible. It's a wonderful story about Jesus' mercy, love, grace, healing, power, how it should be all celebrated by a God who restores and makes whole of his people whom he's redeemed. After this man was healed, he was brought to the Pharisees. And you know what the reaction was? It wasn't 
worship, it wasn't celebration, it wasn't joy that this guy had eyesight. It was condemnation of Jesus because he did this on the Sabbath. He healed this broken man, outcast, never seen in his life. And they said, oh, you did that on Saturday. That's not a good thing. You see, the spirit of a Pharisee, which we all carry, cares more about laws, more about man-made religion, what we can and can't do or shouldn't or shouldn't do according to man than the grace and mercy of God. You're either driven by law or driven by grace. And each one of us needs to be careful with our hearts because we're prone to self-righteous legalism, loving our interpretation or application of law, forgetting so easily that we're only saved by God's grace from beginning to end. It's grace upon grace upon grace. It's what enters in, ushers us into salvation. It's what will carry us through this life, not our obedience per se. God calls us to be obedient. It's God's grace that carries us through a grace that should drive us to growing obedience. You see, the spirit, it's the spirit of Sabbath keeping, not so much the letter of the law, but the spirit of Sabbath keeping. That is the key. And if we have that, then there's there's some allowances. There's allowances for what uh, historically has been called works of necessity. Boss calling you into work. Well, there's no allowance for that when the spirit of the law is driving you, not the letter of man-made law is driving you. And not just works of necessity, but works of mercy. If you understand the spirit of the Sabbath, we want to be like Jesus, but we have works of mercy in his name, just like we see Jesus doing. And frankly, if we weren't so caught up in our regular labors and controlled by them, we'd actually have time to do ourselves if we took Sabbath rest. Seriously. You know, we're told, as I said before, less about specific ways to observe the Sabbath than we want, we might want. We would like a bunch of rules, wouldn't we? Then it would be clear. <laughs> We'd know exactly what to do. So since we don't have all of those, at least from God, I think we're called to celebrate Sabbath liberties, not just man-made laws. Man wasn't made for the Sabbath, the scriptures teach. The Sabbath was made for man. Mark chapter 2, verse 27. We're not made to glorify the Sabbath, but the Sabbath was given to God's people so that we would glorify Him in our rest. And maybe you're thinking, well, I go to church, I take it pretty easy on Sunday. Well, that's good. That's good. I'm glad you're getting some rest. And if Sabbath rest, verse 14, is more unto the Lord and not so much about you, but a deliberate movement of rest worship. And we'll want to be reading the Bible. We'll want to be meditating on it and in prayer and even in fellowship. I, I love our uh, Sunday luncheons, although maybe not the most restful event of the day. Uh, but it, there is something sweet about the body of Christ, rest fellowship, as it were, serving out of Sabbath rest. Resting and caring for the temple of the Holy Spirit, which is the body of any true believer in Jesus Christ, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. All of that because of the rest we have in Jesus. And that's where I'm going to take us now, the Sabbath and salvation. In Deuteronomy, the reason for the Sabbath is the exodus. It's salvation. Look at verse 15 with me. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. And therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. Salvation rest had been given to Israel, so a, a weekly rhythm of rest was to reflect that. Now, if you were to go back to page 61 of that Black Bible, in Exodus chapter 20, where you had the first giving of the law, those of you that have been around know that this is a, a second giving of the Ten Commandments. If you looked at the first giving of the Ten Commandments, you would see that it was God's Sabbath, uh, uh, the reason for the Sabbath was God's creative work. God created six days and then he rested. He didn't rest because he was tired, because he was done. It's all very good. He 
look at it as it were and said, this is the way things are supposed to be, and so I am done from my creative work. Rest it. And you see, these two things complement each other, what we have in Exodus and what we have in Deuteronomy, the fact that God calls his people to rest because he's a creator and because he is one who is a redeemer. We're to rest because God made us and because he has saved or remade us in Jesus Christ. The Exodus was a recreation as God took Israel from slavery in Egypt, saving them from the, the hard taskmaster of Egyptian labor. And he gave them salvation rest. And keeping, keeping the Sabbath was a reflection of salvation. Life was still full of labor for them. Physical labor. Emotional labor. Can you track with me here? Relational labor. Spiritual labor. Just like you and me. But they and we are given a provision of rest in the midst of all of that. Israel was on the, on the move toward the promised land. And, and foreign people were going to be looking in and, and seeing who are these people. Keeping Sabbath would be a sign of who they belong to. And you see, that's true for us as well. And it's even, it's even greater for us if we trust in Jesus Christ. It's greater, listen to me, because we're not merely given a day for Sabbath rest, but we're given God himself, Jesus, as our Sabbath rest. Jesus hasn't come to abolish the law, including Sabbath rest, Matthew 5, 17, but to fulfill it. The Sabbath was a shadow of the substance of the ultimate rest that's come in Jesus. Turn with me to Colossians chapter 2. If you're unfamiliar with the Bible, you'll find that on page 984. Colossians chapter 2. And uh, look with me at verses uh, 16 and 17 there. Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink, or with regard to a festival or to a new moon or a Sabbath. Watch this. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Amen. Jesus is our Sabbath rest. And that was inaugurated. That Sabbath rest was inaugurated in the victory that he had over the grave when he rose from the dead. And that's why early Christians were gathering on Sunday to worship the risen Christ who defeated the evil one, defeated personal sin, and promised forgiveness, and eternal life. You see, Jesus, Mark 2, 28, is Lord of the Sabbath. It's his command. He is greater than it, and he is the substance of it. The Sabbath is from him. It points to him. It reveals him, and it is fulfilled in him. And there, the Sabbath, therefore, the Sabbath isn't done away with but fulfilled and offered to you in Jesus. There remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God, Hebrews 4, 9. That Sabbath rest comes in Jesus. It comes from a man who was God, who lived and worked perfectly for you so that when he went to a cross, he could be an accepted substitution as he was beat up torn apart, crucified, ultimately murdered, put to death as a sacrifice for your sins. So that if you trust in him, you have rest from your sin forever. Yeah. Is that you? Have you given your life to Jesus Christ and his Sabbath salvation for your soul? It can be today. You can actually become a follower of this risen king today if you give your life to him committing yourself to the forgiveness he offers and following him as long as you have life here on this earth and you know this sabbath rest that we have in jesus gives us a taste of what we'll have for all eternity a time and work is never burdensome when worship will never be a chore 
when we'll never be in need of physical rest or spiritual renewal again. But for now, Sabbath rest is to be a remembrance of salvation like Israel. It's our distinguishing mark as followers of Jesus Christ because we're at rest. We are at peace with God wherever you go if you are covered in the blood of Jesus. And our Sabbath rest in Jesus have brought us rest from that greatest need, the labor of our sin. And here's what I mean by that. If you're trusting in Him, you're not only forgiven, you're free from its dominion over your soul. You have the energy, the, the, the power by God's Spirit to do the work of resting from the horrible labor of your sin. You are what the Bible says, a new creation. 2 Corinthians 5.17 reads this. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Watch this, it gets even better. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come to your soul. You know the one who's made you new, the Lord of the Sabbath? He's not resting right now. He's still working. He's in heaven, interceding on your behalf at this very moment. Jesus is talking to God the Father on our behalf. You know what else he's doing? He's preparing a place for you, John 14. And not just you, but me and all the members of the body of Christ. He's preparing our heavenly rest, our heavenly eternal Sabbath. And therefore, if you're in Jesus' Sabbath rest now, you're going to get to work. Six days of a week, as it were, doing our work for the Lord, not to the man, Ephesians 6. But, but really, and more importantly, I think every day, all day long, we're to do the work of trusting the forgiveness that Jesus says he has for you. We're to do the labor of mercy because our God is a God of mercy. We're to do the work of prayer and evangelism and worshiping with life, not just on Sundays. We're free to do so now. You see, we're to now make all of life holy unto the Lord, the King of the Sabbath. And Jesus says something to you. He says, if you're weary, if you're heavy, Come to me. Keep coming to me. And I will give you rest. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we lift high the glory of your resurrection, how that has brought us real rest from the labor of our sin. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that as we come to you now at this table, that you would give us rest as we remember your salvation, your Sabbath rest for our sinful souls. And so we pray that you would bless us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Take a couple moments. Uh, it's our custom here. To just be quiet. to rest. Just think about uh, the good news of Jesus for you, for me. And uh, prepare yourself as we participate, remember, peace by faith on our Savior. tired in all the various ways that the body or soul can be tired are you Jesus makes a promise and he keeps the promises that he makes he says if you come to me I will give you rest he promises rest personally to those who know him 
But it takes us coming to him, and it takes us coming to him by faith. That means trusting him. And that's the very thing that this table is about. It's, a, it's an actual table of rest. It's one of the ways Jesus' people for 2,000 years have been coming to him. There's nothing magical about this table. But, oh, there's something very, very spiritual about this table. This is where we remember and commute. We come to our Lord Jesus, our Sabbath rest. We do it again as the body of Christ week after week after week with our physical senses. And this is where we are refreshed in the Sabbath rest of our salvation. That's what's meant to happen here. Reminder of forgiveness. Reminder of freedom. Reminder of full peace with God for anybody who trusts in Jesus. Is this you? Are you a follower of, of the Sabbath rest of God? Is this your profession to others? If so, if you are a born again, professing, baptized member of the Church of Jesus Christ in good standing, you've not been told that you cannot come to this, and you are not just invited, you're really commanded to come here and feast by faith our Savior who is risen from the dead in heaven. And what we have here to feast on just common elements. We have bread. Unleavened, because leaven reminds us of sin. And unleavened bread reminds us of sinless Jesus. We also have gluten-free bread. I can pass that out if you let me know that you need that. Just raise your hand. We have watered-down wine on our outer rings of our trays. And grape juice in the center cluster to remember the real human lifeblood of Jesus. spilled out of his body for salvation. If you're not sure exactly what your relationship with Jesus is like, or you know for sure that you're not following him, he is not your life. Forgiveness is not found in him for you. Then we ask you to remain right where you are, uh, refrain from partaking of these elements, and reflect upon the good news for your soul. But if you are a follower, come. Come to Jesus and he'll give you rest. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for giving uh, to us uh, tangible reminders of your dying love. And I pray that you would uh, help us by faith to come to you now and to be refreshed in the rest that you offer to your people. And that that would strengthen us for all that you have for us in the coming week. So, Lord Jesus, we pray with thanksgiving. In your name, amen. Amen. On the very night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he, he gave thanks and then he, he broke it and he, he said to the guys that were with him, this is my, this is my body, it's, it's given for you, it's getting ready to be torn apart. And so as you eat this, not just 2,000 years ago, but today, do this in remembrance of Jesus.
your Sabbath rest is found.